Guess what we're studying? First John 1 through 6. In the world, not of the world, that is the question. But how many times in your life, as you talk to yourself, to other people, or whoever, and you hear this statement, but that's what I believe. That's what I think. That's how I perceive it. This is how I look at it. Did you notice the common word wrapped up in all those sentences? Who caught it? I did. I did. Yes, I did catch that. And we live in a world, hear this, where our experiences defined our reality, so therefore, this is true. And I get to say it. Ooh, that's scary. <laughs> but, but that's the world we live in. By the world, this is not the first time our world has lived in that reality. We, 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 <laughs> we as human beings kind of redo things and recycle things. And because we do things and recycle things, we're just repeating things that came back in the, the 60s, back in the 1600s with the Germans, back in, I mean, it, it goes all the way back. I don't even, I don't know, John was dealing with it, you know. Um, I can't remember the word, with those Gnostics, thank you, the Gnostics. I know there was a word in there. Uh, did it go away? Fine. May I draw all your attention to this screen? So you three need to come over here so you can see the screen. That way I'm not sitting in the middle of it. I know when I hooked it up, both screens were working. Ah. Raised from the dead. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, Gnostics. So, you ever heard the saying, there's nothing new under the sun? Well, guess what? John is dealing with, there's not, by the way, before John, this was going on. We can go back to the Greeks, we can go back to the Romans, we can go back, we just, it's just going on, you know. What is it? I am, therefore, I know, or something like that. <laughs> There's some kind of phrase like that. Um, remember we, a couple of weeks ago we talked about how we need to affect the world, but the world doesn't need to affect us. And we live in a society where I think the world affects the church more than we affect the world. And how do we know when that is happening and when that is not happening? Nate, if I move this pulpit over a little bit, can you? is it easier to frame that? Okay, I just figured I'd be nice to you. Um, so John, I think, speaks to some of this directly. So we're going to look at the verses. We're going to look at some of the Greek and Hebrew. We've been into Greek and Hebrew lately. I don't know if you all noticed that, but I get to do it too. You know. But I promise you, I am not going to pronounce the Greek words. They will be up there. If anybody wants to try to pronounce them, good luck. I didn't even put the phonetic saying, so I would try to do that because I still butcher it. So, and if you want to really know, just look it up in your phone. It'll say it for you. Um, but John chapter 1. Wow, that's a little hard to read, isn't it? Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. And there's lots of noise and clutter. So when people come and claim to speak by the spirit, how do you get the clutter out? How does it become more clear and readable? Or do you allow all the clutter to confuse you? Ever thought about that? This is what John is talking about. It. I thought that was pretty cool. Wait, how many? Raise your hand if you thought that was cool. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. You're my friend. 
So let's look at it. Dear friends, do not believe. Okay, we talk about the Greek word believe. To have faith in. So what he's saying is, dear friends, don't have faith in everything that claims to be spoken by the Spirit. Now this word spirit here, based in its context, means different things. Today we're going to define this as a current of air or breeze, demonic or evil spirit. It is also the same word for the Holy Spirit, but its context is different. <laughs> and how do we know this context is right? Look what we're reading. So, don't put your faith in every wind that blows and saying that happens, but test to test, approve, and examine. So let's go back and think about this. Don't put my faith in all the stuff that's out in front of me that's driving me crazy, but test it, approve it, and examine it. Do the work. That they come from where? Theos, God. See, I got that one right. <laughs> that divine, superior God, King of kings, Lord of lords, that these spirits come from him. And if they don't come from him, where do you think they come from? Okay. Everybody hates me when I do this because I'm going to go on my little rabbit trail. Okay? When it comes to God, it's binary. There's God and not God. No gray, okay? There's good and there's evil. No gray. So therefore, if it doesn't come from God, it comes from, what's that word we use? The world, the flesh, the enemy, which are all not God, evil, and not good. Now, here's the bad news in life. Just because I'm human, I practice evil and not good on people all the time, and I really wish I didn't. <laughs> but if I keep Jesus in my life, maybe I'll learn not to do that. It doesn't condemn us because we do that. But what it does is we understand why do we work so hard to know what we know is so that we don't injure and hurt others. And by their love, they will know that they know and love by Jesus. Yeah! Now, I don't know that... Every time I think of that, it shakes me to my core to go, God, I want to get better because I don't want to do that. So, examine, test. Okay, let's go on. Dear friends, so, same verse. For there are many false prophets in the world. False prophets. Now, here's the thing. When we think of prophets... We think of people who speak for God and do all kinds of that. And if you're a false prophet, you one who doesn't hear from God. But it just doesn't mean those kind of prophets. Prophets are also people who are religious imposters. I like that. People who are going around going, I know the truth. This is what I believe. You need to believe me because I believe it. They're religious imposters. And believe it or not, John is probably talking about more of the religious imposters than he is false people who pretend to foretell for God. Get it? So understand what we're talking about? So if I was going to say this verse in Tony E's, I just made the, oh wait, excuse me, I forgot about this one. World. Cosmos. Order. Arrangement. It, it, it's, it's that creation, that order, that arrangement. And, and one of the subwords are Decorations. I want you to think of that word decorations. It's kind of fun. So if I was going to put this in Tony E's, don't put your faith in any idea that blows in, but examine it. Many false ideas and teachings are out in the world, and they look like pretty decorations. Isn't that good? That's Tony E's. You know, not Greek, not Hebrew. <laughs> Made it up today. 
And Eve looked at the apple and saw that it was good. Pretty decorations. So do you see what John is talking about? Don't be sneered with the things of this world that can entrap you. Test it. Okay. I think everybody would raise their hand and go, I'm in. I get that. That's a good idea. Okay. So, verse 2. This is how we know. Ooh. Now he's going to tell us how we know something might look like a shiny decoration. Okay. This is how we know. If they have the Spirit of God, if a person claims to be a, a prophetic acknowledging that Jesus comes. Did I write that right? If a person claims to be a prophet acknowledging that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. Okay. This is one of the most important verses you could ever read in the Bible because it tells you something very important because it says if that person does not understand and proclaim and gives glory to the incarnation of Christ, they are not of Christ. That word incarnation, it's God became man and God man lived among us. It's essential to Christ. You cannot be a Christian without understanding that. Period. I'll get into that later. So, no. Ooh, another Greek word. You know, just something in me just wants to try to say the word. I'm going, no, don't do it. <laughs> the devil making me do that. <laughs> anyway, allow or be aware, feel and to know. Hmm. To feel and to know and be aware. So, so this is how we become aware and feel if they have a spirit of God. Hmm, okay. If a person claims, hmm, claim, covenant to ascend or to, not, to give acknowledgement. If they ascend, if they say, yeah, Jesus is Lord. He is the Son of God come in flesh to die on the cross for me. And God, who made a way for me, who isn't subordinate to the Father, but the same. That Jesus died for me. Now, if you're talking to somebody down the street, I probably wouldn't go into that much detail. Claim. So we ascend, we claim, we speak, we make covenant with. Unbroken agreement. That he came in the flesh. Hmm, flesh. Skin. Human being. <laughs> Sometimes Greek words just don't have to be defined, you know. But this doesn't mean flesh like in your spirit, flesh, da, da, da. This means flesh. Skin. Okay. So if I was going to use Tony E's, if we acknowledge Jesus as the anointed one who comes as a human being that is God, the supreme deity, deity, divinity, excuse me. Get that? that? That's who we're talking about. Okay? That, see it? On the cross, God in his glory. I just want to go, whoo! Okay, verse 3. But if someone claims, claims, assent, give knowledge, to be a prophet, what is that? One who, religious imposter, okay? And does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from who? Theos. So someone or something or some, something who rejects the idea of the incarnation is not of God. Ooh, such a person has the spirit of antichrist. Okay, in our world, the last days, the antichrist is coming, da 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 da. Antichrist gets really, really confusing. Let me make it simple against Christ, anti. Antimatter, no matter. 
Antichrist, no Christ. You take Christ out of the equation, it's Antichrist. Now, we have the Antichrist who will ultimately do that in its full glory for the enemy one day. The book of Revelations. But very often as we walk through life, we run into the Antichrist, those who deny Christ incarnation and death and resurrection on the cross all the time. And we are confronted with it. And it is a measurement to know that what we hear and we see is right. Get it? Tony Ease. Many false ideas and teachers who don't put their faith that Jesus came in the flesh are against Jesus and are just pretty decorations and those decorations are out there. Which you hear is coming into the world, and indeed they are already here. Those decorations are out there. You know, I run into, uh, I'm just going to say it, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses fall in this category. And they fall in this category for one reason. Are you a Mormon? Because they all just looked at you. Oh, okay. Okay, just check it, because it's like I said that, and they all went. <laughs> if I offend you, let's talk. But the reason why is very simple, because we as believers believe that God and Jesus are the same substance. Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons believe that Jesus was a creation of God and a different substance. Okay? And that's really important. One is a creation. Jody and I had four little creations. They are not us. You know what I'm saying? My children are not me. Jesus and God, same substance. Different substance. I have met hundreds of Jehovah Witnesses and hundreds of Mormons. And the moment I bring this point up, you know what they do? They leave. They're not allowed to talk about it. I have talked to the elders. I, I even went three years to the Mormon little training camp. They do, you know, back. I did it for three years. Fundamentally, every conversation came to same substance, different substance. And that... They will openly acknowledge. And that's what I say that differs. That's what makes them anti-Christ. Now, in our world today, we're not supposed to do that because this is offensive. Yeah, it is. The gospel is offensive. How'd I do? <laughs> but if you want to talk, we can talk. Now, what I will tell you, do I know Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses that are Christian? Oh, you bet you're bippy. Because they can't do it out loud, but they profess Christ. They know the difference. Christ has revealed themselves. Some of them are bishop's wives. Some of them are, you know, <laughs> I won't even tell you. But you can't go around saying it out loud. <laughs> but you know what? They say it in their heart, and they say it to those who they can trust. And they are believers. And they those believers I celebrate with. That's a different conversation. So, going on. Oh. Look, Woody. Shiny things. <laughs> I mean, that's the world we live in. We're attracted by shiny things. But the shiny things very often are anti-Christ. Verse 4, but you believe, Theos and God, divine supreme, my children, you have already, what? Victory. Conquered, prevailed, got victory. There is no question we won because he did it. And clean is clean. And paid for is paid for. 
Works is not required. We have victory. Oh, I love that. In the world, in all these pretty decorations, we have victory. And we have that victory and that, that world because we have victory. What does it say? You have already won a victory over the people because the spirit who lives in you is what? Greater than the spirit who lives in the world. My Tony E's. You are my beloved. You are the one who comes in the, you came in the flesh. So don't worry. He is greater than every idea that blows in and blows out of this world. My beloved. I like that. These people belong to the world, so they speak from the world's point of view, and the world listens to them. Speaks, talk, utterance, preaches. The world, those who are anti-Christ, preaches to who? Us. Yeah, we're preached at all the time. Do you feel it? Hmm. And what does it say? And those who belong to the world, so they speak from the world's point of view, and what? The world gives audience to it. It tickles their ears. Hmm. The world who preaches to itself listens to itself. You like that one too? <laughs> Love the picture. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Verse 6. But we belong to God, Theos, and those who know God, Theos, listens to who? Us. We listen to each other because why? We know him who's from the beginning. We know Christ came as flesh. We know that he paid for our sins. We know. And these are the things that we speak to us to lift us up so that we have fellowship with each other and fellowship with him. Because we listen to each other because we know him. Huh, I like that. We allow and be aware and feel and know from each other. We listen to hear and we give audience. Why? We belong to God and those who belong to God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen. They do not know him. They cannot become aware of him or feel him or know him. And that spirit, that current that flows, they listen to and they're distracted by. And that's a pretty decoration. And that truth, that truth within them is not validated and true and vetted. But because we know him, it's validated, it's truth, and it's vetted. It's proven, not just by me and my experience, but by history of the church. And that is a rock we can stand on. But those, someone, this is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception, the spirit of illusion, because they're not in him. They do not know him. They do not call the incarnation out. And they don't believe that Christ, God, died on the cross. Tony E's. We who are beloved and who abide in him and the other beloveds listen to us. And those that are not the beloved does not hear us. And we know that and we know what is truth and what is not. Amen? And it will set us free. Isn't that wonderful? So, I want you to know that I was studying all this and we were meeting yesterday and I was talking about, you know, it's really interesting because John uses this three-legged stool to test truth. And it's tradition, it's the Holy Spirit, and it's the council of believers. And those are the three legs that he uses throughout all of 1 John to talk about how to verify the truth. Well, what we know, I don't know if you know this, but 
they didn't have scripture as we know it today. They didn't have a book they could go to. They're, they were lucky maybe once a month they would hear the Torah read somewhere. You know, they may have a couple letters. But generally, what we call scripture today, not even really till you know, 14, between the 14th and 16th century, depending on who you were. Printing press really helped that. But it wasn't until the printing press that everyone ended up getting what we call scripture. So, so when I talk about this, that was the measurement that John, and I was talking about this yesterday, and you know, Mike says, oh, that's the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And I went, Wesley quadrilateral? What's that? <laughs> and, and so he looked it up on his phone, and I took a picture of it, and, and I went, yeah, that's the Wesley quadrilateral is exactly what John has been saying in the book of John, plus scripture. So let's look at this. I think it's worthwhile. First thing, we start with on the top, the word, scripture. The logos and the rhema. The living word and the written word that was given to us to guide us. Okay? It's our first test. Ooh, history and tradition. What do you think of that one? That sounds like religion. Well, we're going to talk about this a little bit. But believe it or not, the second thing we look at is history and tradition. If it burrs you up a little bit when I say that, keep listening to me. There's more to say on it. The next is the counsel of godly reason. Godly men and women coming together, him who know him, who are not the Antichrist, who believes him in flesh, who understands these principles, come together. And we talk about it. And last but not least, guess what that is? Our experience. I don't think that's the order we do it in our world today. I think we do it in a different order. And we may even leave a couple out. But before we get there, let's talk about it a little bit. So, we have to remember that everything has context to what? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how we relate to them. Christ come, Christ rose, Christ come again. These are the fundamental truths. It ain't about hymns, it ain't about songs, it ain't about benches, it ain't about chairs, it ain't about lights, it ain't about fog. It's about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the incarnation, the sacrificial atonement. Christ come alive. And these have been concepts that are based in the earliest church that we have spoken on and shared through history. And they're foundational. So, the Bible. I just want to put this out there. The Bible is God's word for all men. It was written by human authority under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit it is the supreme source of truth for Christian belief and living. Did I cover it all, Mike? Nate, happy with that? Okay, I think it said it pretty well. I found like a couple more that were like three pages long. I went, yeah, I think I'm good with this. <laughs> yeah, I think that sums it up. The Logos and Rhema, word, scripture, foundational. History and tradition. Okay, I'm going to try this. I want you to know I had fun with this. I really did. I'll tell you why later, Nate. You'll laugh at me. You know where I got it from? Christian history and tradition holds a significant place as it fosters a deeper understanding of evolving beliefs, practices, and interpretations within Christianity. Exploring denominations or movement... Movement... Somebody say that word. Movement illuminates diverse theology, perspectives, cultural influences, and doctrinal development. It enables individuals to grasp the richness of Christ through religious pluralism. In, yeah, I tried that one. I really did. <laughs> and encourages dialogue among believers, fostering a more inclusive and comprehensive understanding of our faith 
as it evolves. I think that's a pretty good conclusion in whatever, 50 words. People write books on this. <laughs> I tried to narrow it down. Mike, what do you think? Fair statement? Scott, you like that? So, history and tradition. Okay, I know that was a lot. If you want it, I'll send it to you. It's wordy. It has big words in it. It has lots of concepts in it. It would take me three hours to unpack, unpack that paragraph. It is rich with history. Council of Godly Reasons. You know, when, when, I, when Mike said this yesterday, I just went, that was a weird way of saying it. But it's really good when you think about it. Council, gathering together of godly, those who believe in theos, those who relate to Jesus, yeah. And we sit, we come to the city gates and sit and reason and talk about the truths of God. Yeah. See, we go to Acts chapter uh, 25, uh, verse 28, and it says, For it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on, on you than those few requirements. And this is where people were saying, oh, all the new Christians need to be Jewish, and all the new Christians need to be circumcised, and all this can't eat meat. And they, there was all these rules coming down. And, and, and the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 came together and went, and that's where Peter says, hey, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're Gentiles, and they don't know Jesus. <laughs> what are we going to do? They sat down and reasoned for three days. And do you know what? They couldn't come to an agreement. They came to mostly an agreement. But at the end of that council, the leader, James, the brother of Jesus, stood up and said, okay, it seems reason, this was a statement, it seems reason to us and the Holy Spirit that we don't put too much requirements on them. And it was, don't eat meats after idol. I can't remember the two. But it was really, okay. The value of elders, leaders, teachers, pastors are a great value for me as a believer. And God, we know from Ephesians chapter 4, he gave us those to build and equip the church. Okay? Last one. Oh, by the way, let's, going back on history and tradition. Ah, wrong button, wrong button. Come on, come on. Okay, there we go. Wow. Ah, uh, we're going to be a minute. Can you start the slideshow? That's what happens when you push the wrong button. Okay. So, uh, let's talk a little about history. Let's talk about, you've heard of the Nicene Creed. Okay, we've said it a couple of times. Well, it was in 30, uh, 325 B.C., no, C, uh, A.D., that the Council of Nicene got together. They defined the nature of God for all Christianity and eliminated confusion, controversy, and what's that word? What was that word? Contention. Yeah, I know. I knew it was contention, but I was playing with you. Contention within the church. Hmm. The Council of Reasons come together to bring unity and bring clarification. Okay? They also developed what's called the Nicene Creed, which was one of the fundamental creeds that all Christians have said or spoke, spoken or have learned from for what? 2,000 years almost. That's pretty amazing. They did it way back then. Then you have the, the, the Council of Constantinople in 381. The council dealt with, with a fatal blow to our Armenianism. Do you know Armenians modern day, you know what that is today? Jehovah's Witnesses. There's nothing new under the sun, but they bled a devil and they clarified the language use to describe the Trinity. Again, they brought unity. The Council of Rachel? Chalcedon, 451. The council ruling was an important step in future clarifying the nature of Christ and the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Okay? The Middle Ages, Ages and the Dark Ages. There was
wasn't a lot going on at that time. But there was something that was interesting. There was a thing that was called the doctors of the church. The church realized that there were specific people in the world, Augustine, Augustus, who were doctors of the church. And they influenced the church. And they, they didn't have these councils, but they acknowledged that these people were important to listen to for the unity of the church and the health of the church. And it happened in one of the most Middle Ages and Dark Ages ain't the prettiest time. I, I found that being one of the most interesting phenomenons. God still had our back when it was the darkest time. The Westminster Confession, 1640. A shorter confession, a catechism, containing 107 questions and answers concerning God and as creator, origin in sin, the fall of man's nature, Christ the Redeemer, the Ten Commandments, baptism, the Holy Communion, and the Lord's Prayer. Do you know 30 years ago, if you were in church, you had to memorize that. Yeah, growing up, that was part of catechism for me. I, I had to study those things. They're really good, you know. Hmm, the Restoration Movement, early 1900s. The Restoration Movement rejected rules and practices that did not come explicitly from the Bible and causing unnecessary division within the church. What do you think? Do you think that history and tradition plays a part in our life? Believe it or not, half the things we say, we teach on, we experience comes from on top of the shoulders of men and women who have already done this. And we don't need to invent a new wheel because <laughs> the Nicene Creed is probably one of the best wheels I've ever seen. And it doesn't have to be reinvented. Now, I'm going to stop here and pause because we use the word tradition. And I think sometimes when we use tradition, we, we confuse it. History and tradition is the legacy of our past that we carry on and bring forward. Very often when someone says tradition, what they're really saying is liturgy. We're talking about liturgy in the church. There's high liturgy and low liturgy. There, it, 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 it's the difference between form and substance, how you do something and the substance behind it. The early church councils and the tr history and tradition are talking about that substance when, when we talk about liturgy, so when we say, I, you know, I don't like religion, what we really should be saying is, I don't, like, I don't like Strick's form of liturgy. Liturgy, what is it? Liturgy is how we come together. Do you know that we have a liturgy? It opens with a video. And then we sing a song. No, then Mike says something. Then we sing a song. And then there's announcements. And then there's a prayer. And then there's teaching. And then there's a close. That would be called low liturgy. <laughs> the Catholics, Episcopals, um, uh, the Anglicans would be high liturgy. And there's sometimes, there's a lot of church, there are churches that have low liturgy that have just form but no substance. And there are high churches that I know of that have lots of substance and form. And there's a lot of them that have form with no substance. So I just challenge you to think about when you use the word tradition, what are you talking about? Because I believe tradition and history has played a vital role in the formation for me as a believer today and in every one of us. Mike, what do you think? And, and, and sometimes we reject that out of hand just because of the word. Let's find out if it's form or substance before we reject it. So, the last one. Hey, my experience. <laughs> you know what? Here's the truth. Everything I look at, I determine from one of three points. The flesh, the evil desires that well up within me that try to pull me down. The enemy, powers and principalities we do not battle, but, you know. Or the Holy Spirit. So most times when I'm trying to, in my own experience, try to figure out what's going on, there's a good chance two out of three of them ain't God. 
But sometimes I keep calling my experience going, yep, that's God. Yep, that's God. One of the reasons this triangle is formed, or not this triangle, but the, uh, the quadrilateral is formed is because we start with scripture, we go to history and tradition, we go to counsel of many, and we go to experience. And if we do it in that order, we're probably more sound. But today, what do we do? Well, what is truth? Well, yeah, we think scripture plays a big part of it. Well, yeah, we do. Yeah, history and tradition. What do you think? <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the elders are pretty smart, and, you know, the guy who's preaching, he's pretty good. He's not bad. But this is what I believe. <clears throat> this is what I think. And it trumps all three. It's a, da- it's a dangerous ground. I believe health is keeping all of those boxes equal and using the right box at the right time. And if you just have one box that you're using, you're probably in trouble. Even if you're using two and one of them is scripture, you're better off. But when you round it out and, and we understand that, that I'm, I'm on the top of the food chain of, of, of history, okay? There are hundreds of people that I stand on their backs to know what I know. And I give God praise for that. So... If your experience is a 10, and your scripture is a 7, and your history and tradition is a 2, and whatever those elders say is a 3, maybe you need to stop for a minute and say, do I need to work on that? Am I the ruler of my own life and I make the decisions? Now remember, I put the, you know, if we go back here, I want you to know I put the most important passage I, I quoted all the time. 1 John 2, 27, therefore you need no one to teach you anything because the anointing you receive teaches you all things. I believe that. It's a 10. So is the word of God, Raymond Logos. It's a 10. I've used church history in my life. Not lately, so I'm going to call it an 8. In the council of many, every time I preach, every time I talk, I talk with, I have a guy who's an expert in Greek and Hebrew, and we always talk about whatever he's doing and whatever I'm doing, and you know, he, he, he only reads Greek and Hebrew. So it's really cool when you talk to him. And when he talks, he, he kind of talks Tony E's. And it's like, well, that's really cool. i got to learn how to do that. <laughs> but so I do that. You know, every week, Friday, uh, the three elders and I, the, the, the current preaching team, sit together for two, maybe three hours. And we deal with this passage. We deal with it yesterday. And the benefit of that. Mike, what's the benefit of that for you? And how has it affected you since you've been on it? You get to vet it. I like that word. You're not on an island either. I mean, sometimes if you're, if you're just in your own head, you think it sounds good until you try to actually do it and preach it or live it out. It doesn't work to play out. You've got experience. You've been a believer longer than I have. You've got more experience than I have. It's not the same way. So, so, so have you ever been challenged and changed your mind in that meeting? Absolutely. Nate, have you ever been challenged and changed your mind? I know I have. You know. So what benefit is for you, Scott? I'm orthogonal. I like that word. <laughs> Come with a warning. <laughs> If you're only saying your idea to yourself, you're probably in trouble. When you say it to someone else, it allows it to go and allow the Holy Spirit and God and Scripture and history all to come into it. But if you just keep it to yourself and not be in community, you're in trouble. You're, you're, 
no, you're not in trouble. You have a chance of being in trouble. So, okay. Wow. So, <clears throat> I am pushing the wrong button. No, I am pushing the right button. How did I get back here? Oh, yeah, because I moved back there. Okay. Ah, there we go. So today I challenge you with how do you allow Scripture? Is it 10 by 10? History and tradition, is it 10 by 10? The community of believers, is it 10 by 10? Is it experience, 10 by 10? By the way, don't diminish experience. Keep that up there. All of them should be 10 by 10. Because now we're talking the fullness of what God has used through history to build and teach and nurture and bring together believers. And this is what John was saying in 1 John. When he says, test every spirit, how do we do it? He gave us one clue, incarnation, Christ, God, big one. Put that one on the top of your list. You get it?